Jerry Douglas was known to some as the godfather of gay porn. And though Douglas wore many hats as a novelist, playwright, and theater director, here we will celebrate him as a gay porn director, film historian, master storyteller, and mentor to many figures in the gay porn industry today. Jerry Douglas is justly celebrated as a director of The Back Row, one of the first hardcore films made after Stonewall. The Back Row is a precious artifact, showing a pre-Disney-fied Times Square and the seedy, gritty, 70s New York City that is a legend to many people who remember it. But The Back Row also documented a fixture in the culture of gay cruising, the movie theater. Not a lot of people who watch adult entertainment today remember George Payne, though he was one of the more recognizable stars of the golden age of adult film in New York. George Payne entered the porn industry in 1972 with the gay movie The Back Row after coming to New York to do male swimsuit modeling. He transitioned over to the straight side of the industry eventually and gained notoriety for his intense portrayals. On tonight's episode, we're going to celebrate Jerry Douglas, who aside from being a legendary filmmaker, was also a critic of hardcore films and videos, treating them as serious as any other film. As a historian, Douglas almost single-handedly produced an oral history of gay porn from the 1970s to the 2000s, The Back Row, an explicit and somewhat loose version of Midnight Cowboy that earns its place in gay porn history. George Payne, a star during the golden age of porn who began his prolific career in gay porn and later transitioned into straight porn films and became one of the industry's biggest and influential names of the era. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to once again remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Jerry Douglas was born in Des Moines, Iowa on November 15, 1935. After graduating from Drake University, he attended Yale School of Drama and eventually moved to New York where he got small gigs on and off Broadway working for a theatrical agent. He would go on to stage manage off-Broadway shows and eventually begin directing. Douglas wrote several plays and had them staged on and off Broadway, including Score, which was later made into a film starring Casey Donovan, directed by Ridley Metzger, and Tubstrip. It was around that time, a business associate asked Douglas if he'd ever consider making a porn film. Up until that point, Douglas had not thought about it, but after some consideration, he felt like it was the natural progression. Douglas's first film was called The Back Row, starring Casey Donovan and newcomer George Payne. Casey Donovan at the time was riding high on the fame from Boys in the Sand. The Back Row is a film with a documentary-style approach that focused on gay subcultures, when the back row opened, it had a long and successful run at the 55th Street Playhouse. His next film was a bisexual feature called Both Ways. One of the things that may be lost in Douglas's filmography is his 1975 film Both Ways and the significance to the portrayal of bisexuality. Both Ways shows us an honest look at male bisexuality during the 1970s sexual revolution. The film centers around a married father who tries to find balance between family life and the relationship with his male lover. Do you think we'll ever see each other again? I don't usually come back for seconds. Ever? Never. That's cool. It's probably just a phase I'm going through anyway. With Douglas's writing, the film goes on to become not only a hardcore film, but also a character study of the lead in a sexually complicated situation. Some have called Both Ways a companion film to Douglas's score. And Both Ways has recently been updated and released by Vinegar Syndrome. Douglas made three films in the early 1970s, but began to experience issues with the movie theater owners who were at times tied with the mafia. After the release of this film, Douglas lost the rights to Both Ways when his financial backer illegally sold them. At that point, Douglas decided to give up making erotic films. Or 
While working for a magazine packager, Douglas thought of a magazine that would eventually become Stallion. Douglas served as the editor of Stallion until it closed six years later. From his editorial and critical position at Stallion, Douglas would closely observe the developments and trends that were shaping the gay erotic entertainment industry. Douglas mostly covered the world of commercial gay porn production and interviewed porn producers, directors, bringing his critical writing on porn a historical perspective. He would also begin to conceptualize the history of gay adult entertainment and define its major achievements, its periods, and its progress. He started Manshots magazine in 1988, a film review magazine specializing in gay pornography, which not only featured naked men, but in-depth interviews with porn stars, as well as behind-the-scenes people like recluse director Matt Sterling and All World founder Rick Ford, both notoriously shy of the press. After a decade-long break, Douglas returned to making adult films. Dirk Yates, who ran All World Video, coaxed him out of retirement after Douglas negotiated royalties, final cut, and modeled Tim Lowe as the lead for the film. A few days later, pre-production began on Fratrimony. From that moment until 2007, Douglas would go on to direct roughly one film a year. Douglas's films always involved a thoroughly thought-out script. Even the sex itself was scripted. Douglas worked with studios and superstars of the day like Rick Donovan, Mike Hedson, and Joey Stefano. Douglas would deal with many of the gay erotic tropes we would all come to know and fantasize about and frame them in a critical and sometimes controversial way. Whether it was gays in the military in honorable discharge, a father coming out as gay in family values, brotherly love in fratrimony, basketball players, and closeted celebrities. One of his most celebrated films, More of the Man, stars Joey Stefano as a gay man who struggles with his Catholic faith. As a director, Douglas worked with countless studios including Colt, Studio 2000, Odyssey Men, All Worlds, and Sierra Pacific to name a few. And whenever I... I begin to work with an actor on one of my films, one of the first things I ever say to them is, now, our job is to turn you into your professional name into the character So uh, that's written on the page. You have a three-step process in moving from yourself to your pr professional self to the character. And so often, these kids will fall into the trap of thinking they are, say, Ryan Idol or Jeff Stryker or Ken Riker or whoever. On January 9th, 2021, Jerry Douglas passed away in his home in New York City after a prolonged illness. Jerry Douglas was 85 years old. Douglas was one of the most important figures in the adult gay media world, with a long and passionate career as a playwright, author, director, screenwriter, journalist, art and theater goer, film watcher, and raconteur. Many directors of his day were anonymous, many were filmmakers, but few like Jerry Douglas were auteurs. Douglas's films stood out for their attention to detail and complex themes. Through his films, from his first in 1971, to his last in 2007, Douglas revealed his original vision of hardcore filmmaking. As a historian, Douglas compared the early days of gay porn to the silent era of filmmaking, a time when many of those producing and starring in those films during those crazy chaotic first days would not have envisioned their work to be a study of a specific time. Fun fact, in 1970, Jerry Douglas wrote and staged Score, which we know was made into a movie. But during the off-Broadway production of Score, the actor who played Mike, the telephone repairman, was a young Sylvester Stallone. When it came time to shoot the film, director Ridley Metzger did not cast Stallone because he thought he was too ethnic and would not fit into the European sensibility of the film. Jerry Douglas was no stranger to directing plays that involved nudity. 
While Douglas put himself through school at Yale directing community theater productions, he met a woman whose husband, Sam, would eventually become his partner on his subsequent films. In an interview, Douglas said he was approached by Sam with the idea of making an erotic film. Douglas agreed, but only if it was a gay movie. Sam agreed, and he and Douglas set off to make their first gay erotic film together. Although Douglas did not have experience in filmmaking, it was through this production he discovered he was quite good at it. In order to understand why the back row was culturally significant, it's important we talk about the role of the movie theater in gay culture during the late 60s and early 70s. The 1970s saw the proliferation of theaters in major urban centers specializing in the exhibition of gay pornography. They quickly became popular by both seismic shifts in LGBT visibility in the wake of the 1969 Stonewall riots and larger trends in industry, law, and culture that increasingly brought pornography of all stripes into the mainstream. The theaters, many of them relics of Hollywood's yesteryear playing art house cinema, had a new life and provided a public venue for audiences of primarily gay men to view gay pornography as well as have various erotic and social encounters with one another. The theaters brought possibilities for sexual exploration and subcultural community building. But the theaters also brought economic opportunities to their owners and managers, for whom the exhibition of gay porn offered a means to specialize within an ever more crowded market for pornography of all kinds. Coming to be known as a cruising place for gay men, it was only natural that a film about cruising in a theater, something not seen before on screen by audiences who were aware of the activities and usually participated, created a film with a cultural zeitgeist. And we owe it all to a developing industry, shifting cultural landscapes and movements, and laws that were challenged and re-examined. Gay Point Theaters in the 1970s not only provide a richer account of a key period in the histories of both American pornography, but also opens up new questions regarding the role of the gay porn theater in everyday practices of 1970s era gay men. The Gay Porn Theater will be a topic of conversation I will revisit in a future episode. The back row begins with images of signs promoting sex bars, movie theaters, and bookstores. Then we close up on Casey Donovan's ass. Donovan plays the lead in the back row as a streetwise New Yorker. The director credit in the title card reads Doug Richards, whom we now know was really Jerry Douglas. Almost immediately, Douglas' style can be seen by his opening shots of Donovan lighting a cigarette from behind while a sailor walks into the movie theater. One thing that should be noted is how personal the score is to the film itself. Minimal and brooding, it lends to the visuals so well. The music continues to captivate you as the sailor befriends a stranger in dark glasses, sniffing what I can only assume are poppers. After the sailor and the stranger with glasses are done, Donovan exits the theater and walks the streets of 1970s New York. At the Port Authority bus terminal, Donovan spots George Payne, who is credited as the kid from Montana, dressed as a cowboy. This is Payne's first appearance in a gay porn film. The music in the background again adds to the scene, almost narrating the scene, something I'm sure Douglas was well aware of. Be mindful, it is very 70s and very musical forward. The scene then turns to an empty subway cart, shot very early in the morning to avoid crowds and most importantly, police. Donovan and Payne begin a long game of cruising and teasing each other that would have made any young man in this day and age just go home and jerk off. But I digress. Payne then follows Donovan out of the subway and onto Christopher Street, where they walk all around Lower Manhattan. Donovan leads Payne into an adult toy store where Donovan tries on leather accessories and a pump. Payne then imagines Donovan standing over him and, well, I'll leave the rest to you watch the movie. After Payne wakes up from his daydream, he quickly exits to run after Donovan and they continue their courtship. The cruising continues into a theater where Payne buys a ticket and is greeted by a man who whips out his dick. Payne follows Donovan into the men's room, but seems a bit apprehensive and naive. Payne runs up the stairs and enters the theater when another man enters the stairwell looking for action. 
This time, it is Donovan who follows. And something I didn't consider the first time I watched the back row is Donovan and Payne are sitting down watching a movie within a movie. I wonder if this is a first. This is the first time I've come across it in a gay porn film. Both Donovan and Payne share a joint that today would seem perfectly fine, but was just as taboo as being in a gay porn theater in those days. Payne loosens up a bit, only to find Donovan has a friend sitting next to him now. Donovan persistently tried to get Payne, and only Payne's attention, but is met with ambivalence. Payne attempts to get more cruisy with Donovan, but they are interrupted by an onlooker. Donovan engages with both an onlooker and the flasher from earlier on in the film, while Payne stands outside of the bathroom, upset at what he hears going on inside. When Donovan is done, he gets dressed and walks out of the bathroom to find a pissed off Payne who storms out. Donovan catches up to him and they make up. The back row has a very positive message after going through its own dark nights of the soul. But I like the idea that is presented that Donovan, while seemingly in love with Payne, who is a one-man kind of guy, is still enticed by a man who walks by and cruises Donovan while he's making out with Payne. The back row was filmed only a few years after Midnight Cowboy, a mainstream film with a big box office success and critical acclaim that originally received an X rating. The references in the back row to Midnight Cowboy are all too obvious. Nevertheless, the back row delivers a great narrative with no dialogue. The back row is a technically classy film mirrored with a suitable score. The back row was released and followed Wakefield Pool's Boys in the Sand into the 55th Street Playhouse, where the film enjoyed a longer run but did not enjoy the publicity of being a landmark film. Watching it today, a viewer can truly understand why the back row has earned its place in gay porn history. There was a remake made of the film in the early 2000s that was thankfully just an homage as opposed to a trend that caught on in gay porn films. George Payne was born on February 7, 1944, in Ohio. Payne grew up in a steel mill town with his family, whose roots were Yugoslavian, Croatian, and Tunisian through his father's side. Payne was a quiet child who usually kept to himself, but admits that he was sexually active at an early age. Growing up, he attended parochial school and was for the most part a good student. Payne's mother divorced his father and remarried, moving the family to Palm Springs, where he finished high school. Payne served briefly in the United States Air Force and was honorably discharged. Payne made his way to New York for an audition with a short men clothing line company. From there, he went into male swimsuit modeling. Payne also fell into acting and made appearances in shows like Kojak, and the film Death Wish, starring Charles Brosnan. During the mid-1960s, Payne was featured as a male model in magazines, including Physique Pictorial. At the same time, Payne made his first porn loop under a different name. Payne officially entered the porn industry in 1972 with the gay film The Back Row, directed by Jerry Douglas. The film starred Payne opposite Casey Donovan, who was on top of his game after the release of Boys in the Sand. In the back row, Payne played a recent New York transplant by way of Montana who explores the city and its gay scene. Payne has called the back row his first silent film as there is no dialogue spoken between Payne and Donovan who interact with gestures and display emotion with choreographed interactions. After the film's release, Payne made the decision to continue to market himself to a gay audience and would go on a heavy publicity campaign in support of the film, starting with an interview with The Advocate in 1973. Work steadily came in through the 1970s for Payne, starring in such films as Kiss Today Goodbye, directed by Francis Ellie, and alongside Peter Sass. Payne also starred alongside Jack Wrangler in 1979's Navy Blue. If Payne looks familiar from this podcast, it may be because he played Demetrius in the infamous film Centurions of Rome. This is stupid. I could have fucked her myself. She's probably coughing out. You could have changed her mind. You could have fucked her? I'm the guy who gets the girls, remember? Bullshit. During the 1980s, 
Like some of his contemporaries, including Jack Wrangler, Payne transitioned into making straight porn films and gained a reputation for playing intense characters. These films were predominantly through Avon Theatre and their productions of rough films, which dealt with BDSM themes. In 1988, George Payne retired from hardcore pornography after starring in more than 180 films. Though he retired, he continued to make appearances in non-sexual BDSM roles before finally leaving the industry entirely. After making his debut in Jerry Douglas's seminal gay porn film, The Back Row, Payne went on to star in over 180 adult films, both gay and straight, until his retirement from hardcore in 1988. He appeared in some of the genre's most famous movies, including Tigresses, Other Man Eaters. I'm just so nervous, and, and at this point, I'm just so vulnerable being here with such strong men. Blonde Ambition. Sugar, this is Bob, my roommate. Oh, don't bother to get up. I only came my pin. Help yourself. Thanks. I hear you're gay. Uh, yes. Hmm, pity. Well, each in his own. American Desire. This is Walls. Look, I just have it's these okay. uh, for your husband, okay? Don't and call I just... Mrs. Wells. Call me Melian. This is for him, okay? I just want to give these to him. I don't want a problem, all right? So do I. Okay. Wanda Whips Wall Street. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a long time. You believe it or not, so have I. And Puss in Boots. Present arms. Excellent. Working with many of the era's best directors, actors, and actresses along the way. George Payne is still alive and well, and a bit of a recluse these days. If you are interested in hearing a more in-depth biography of the man himself, the Rialto Report has a great interview with the man, the legend, the icon, George Payne. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord, and if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>